Sunday morning, and maybe what would you be eating? Tony, right? Uh, uh, Tony, uh, Brian, what is it? Uh, I think the Nasi Lama that uh, you took me to at uh, the airport, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good one. Uh, Chinese. Probably, yeah, Chinese uh, yeah. food court. It's one in that apartment complex. Don't test Tony on Singapore food. He, he knows. Yeah, he knows. probably be hitting He's that got hard. my book. Yeah. Got when my you're book. in your hometown, what would you be doing on a Sunday morning? On a Sunday morning, I'd be uh, in my pajamas watching cartoons, watching Adventure Time with my daughter and, you know, not maybe, 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 maybe cooking eggs, whether she'd be in a little pink apron, standing on a stool, and we'd be making eggs together. Brian? I, I would probably be with my wife and my dog, just going to the park. I'm very simple. Uh, I like to stay at home whenever I can. You know, work quite a bit, so on Sundays I take that time to relax. And uh, my wife is actually sitting over there too, so I want to give her some props. Um, but that's what I'd be doing. Even Tito, you have to answer. Um, every Sunday, it's a breakfast buffet spread for me. It's mirabos, nasi lemak, sui kueh, sun kueh, mi siam, the works. Uh, because, strange enough, I do not eat as decadently as I do on a weekday. I gotta do stuff like set up a hawker stall and, you know. But I try, to, I try my best to enjoy life as best as I can on a Sunday morning. Really? Uh, Singapore, you know, is a place for noodles, but I can claim Jakarta has the world's most diverse noodles. Because everywhere you see, <laughs> you know, Tony, uh, Sita should agree with me. And I enjoy comfort food. I go for my early soto, soto ayam, like uh, in, in Indonesia, in satay. This is my favorite place for my breakfast on the Sunday. Um, I'm tempted to say I would like to be with Sito eating his buffet. Uh, but most Sundays, actually, I don't have breakfast. I just have light tea, some Chinese tea, a little bit of bite. I look forward to brunch. It's kind of American habit while studying America. On Sundays, unlike normal days, you really don't want to rush at the start. You don't want to have a busy lunch. You kind of turn in between. That can depend what kind of food I feel like. Well, it really depends on where I am. If I'm at home in Singapore, or whether I'm working in Beijing. In Beijing, it would normally be a, a very, very Beijing breakfast, which is salty serving her with the dough fritters, the yoga. That's my favorite because, you know, we're so used to sweet being her, which I just had with my family. And uh, that it was a novelty. It started as a novelty, but now, you know, it's become a regular Sunday breakfast for myself and my husband. You know, I think I'm going to disappoint you. I don't eat breakfast. <laughs> and Sunday is, is the time that I really smooth along with the motion in the morning. Whatever lying like, there, that's what I do on a Sunday. I know it's a bad habit not to have breakfast. Yes, yes. But look at me. I'm, I'm healthy, except I got a big problem today. Otherwise, Sunday, I rest. I follow God's advice. I don't uh -huh. work on Sunday. I rest of our buffet. Forgive me for my rudeness. I forgot to introduce everybody here in my haste and excitement. So that's Sir Brian Ng, hot chef running the spice table. Yes. Uh, a uh, Singapore Korean style comfort Korean, food it's, restaurant. It's actually Did you say it better. <laughs> It's, uh, what, what we do is we cook Singaporean and Vietnamese food in Singapore because that's where my family's from and Vietnamese because that's where my wife's family is from. Yeah. And Tony Bourdain is Tony Bourdain. Um, I'm the founder of this. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Makan Sutra, a little company we started about 16, 17 years ago. Just trying to see what opportunities there are in the world of street food and now 17 years down the road, we feel this is the moment we should be doing something like this. And we have. Uh, uh, William Wong So, uh, culinary ambassador of in Indonesia of sorts. Uh, as we, we run restaurants, we run shows, we books, blah blah blah. Now he just runs William Culinary Concepts, and he just does everything. It's got to do with Indonesian food. Yeah, Simon, <laughs> Professor Simon Tay, Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. So. And why are you here? Uh, first, because I happen to be a friend of Sito's from National Service Days. 
But secondly, I was the chairman of the National Environment Agency of Singapore, which is in charge of all the local centres. And during my time, we made a point of commissioning the first book that talked about the heritage, the importance of that. And I guess at the ECC of National Affairs, we are very concerned about uh, food, trade, environment. And so when you ask me to talk about some of that, plus the culture aspects, I thought, you know, I love to eat. And if I have to talk before I eat, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, environmental issues is something that I don't really touch on. Pauline. Oh, goodness. You know, I'm just a journalist. Uh, but I'm a journalist who loves to eat, loves to cook. And uh, I had a... Uh, I've worked as a food journalist in one, two, three, four countries. So I guess, you know, that's my qualification. Pauline is actually Singaporean. So her current oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Her current job is the editor of the China Daily. Very, I'm a Singaporean expert. Export. Export. Very, very concerned with about preservation about uh, Chinese food heritage, which is disappearing. Uh, yeah, it's a concern about culinary heritage that started when I was in Singapore. Because I realized that as a Singaporean, uh, we have such mixed ancestral roots, and uh, a lot of it was disappearing. I saw it in my family, you know, my Grandfather was a journalist, my father was a journalist, I am a journalist, still am. And my son studied to become a journalist and wisely joined the civil service. So, you know, but in his generation, I can also see that, you know, he's more concerned with uh, making the perfect pizza and cooking the perfect pasta than he is with uh, cooking the perfect plate of uh, wonton mean or Hokkien noodles. I mean, he likes to eat it, but you know, he just can't be bothered to learn to cook it. And so what I've done is that uh, when I was with uh, the press, I came up with food columns. Uh, I did endless food reviews, some of which I'm notoriously known for still up to today. And, uh, but that's where I think, you know, that's the last surges of uh, your cultural heritage, that's the food you eat. Because we all speak almost perfect English now. We all dress not in our national costumes. But the only thing that we go home to, really, is um, your ethnic or your, um, well, I don't call it ancestral anymore because, you know, we are all Singaporeans. But, you know, it is, if you're a Chinese, you still tend to eat Chinese food. If you're a Malay, you, you still enjoy Malay food. It doesn't prevent you from enjoying other people's uh, food, as in I think, you know, we are the most fortunate country in the world, as in, you know, we get to enjoy so many um, other cultures' food. But it is also very, very important to remember who you are, uh, because the food that you eat is so much a part of your cultural heritage. Uh, and Pauline, that's before you why. give everything away, we're just trying to introduce people. Well, you don't let the world know who Johnny is. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny among other things, question. Johnny is my best friend. So you have tears coming down from my eyes. Johnny, uh, restorer, writer, and master winemaker from Xinjiang. His 1421 wines are the, what's that award you get from the government? That uh, stamp of approval. About the only wine in China that has that. The first traceable wine. Traceable wine. In China or in the world, rather has been uh, doing food shows all over China and all around the world for over 10 years now. He's still at it, he's sitting on that funny chair because he's got a bad back today. So, please, anybody else, uh, any questions? Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Robin Steinberg from the National Critics Voice Online News, uh, New York and Singapore. I have a question for uh, Chef uh, Anthony Borden, and that is, um, could you tell us about the lessons learned as a chef, as a journalist, and as a critique, um, what, what are the three, th three things that you have learned and what, what, what are the three things you could uh, advise for all future journalists? And how do you define uh, being a food critic today? And also, um, just one last question, that is, uh, what's the importance that you see in the, the first World Street Food Congress uh, here in Singapore and the, and, the, and the difference that you see the street food uh, in the United States and Singapore? Okay, I'm um, gonna make short work of the first part of your question. I'm not a critic, never claimed to be a critic. Uh, I have no interest in being a critic. I'm an enthusiast. I'm not a journalist. Uh, I'm an essayist. I'm a storyteller. 
Uh, I was a chef for 30 years. I am no longer a chef. If I have any wisdom to pass along uh, in general uh, for any of those professions, it's show up on time. Whatever it is you do, please show up on time and show the, your coworkers that the respect that you show up on time. Do the best job you can. If you get a lucky break, try real hard to not screw it up. That's really all, I, that's all of my accumulated wisdom. Uh, Look, the importance of the World Street Food Congress to me, I, I see street food in general as a, as a cause, uh, as a force for good, both for selfish reasons, meaning we like delicious food, um, as a means of preserving whatever authentic means, and that's a whole other discussion whether authentic, the word authentic even has any real meaning anymore. But what authenticity there exists, for purposes of the discussion, let's say the food that you grew up eating, that your mother made for you, or your grandmother uh, cooked for you, chances are the last line of defense for the, the cuisine is going to be in street food. Uh, so from that point of view, I embrace it and I see it as an important, an important thing that any enlightened society should support um, as an instrument of social change, meaning street food has always been a way for people with very little in the way of resources to enter business as a practical matter because they don't have money but also if you're a young chef a young hipster chef in Austin Texas and you don't have enough money to open a restaurant you can now buy a, with a food truck or a hawker stall get well known enough get your brand make a statement communicate with the world in a way that that might open uh, a, a wide variety of opportunities um, for so many good reasons, social, and just for personal self-interest, deliciousness. The more street food you have, the more it's embraced by every level of society and every income strata, uh, the better world we live in. Uh, just one last question, that is, uh, what's next for you? Could you share about some future projects uh, in mind and also... Uh, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing as long as I can get away with it. <laughs> more of the same. <laughs> Um, I'm Charlotte, I'm from Destination Magazine, and our readers are visitors to Singapore. So I'd like to ask, could each of you recommend two street food dishes that a visitor to Singapore absolutely must try before he or she heads back to Chani? Well, I just want to feel this with just for reasons of... I found out very painfully <laughs> the, the personal cost of if you've been here over two times and you have not had chicken rice, that can lead to some very yeah. awkward moments. Okay, so okay. I got booed. I got booed by 400 people when I admitted I had yet to try chicken rice after numerous trips. So, for just practical reasons, start start with that. Also, it's delicious. What about you? What else? I need two. Tony, sorry. Well, for me, uh, I love my chicken rice. I like I like laksa. I need laksa. I need it really badly. I like some now. <laughs> Ryan, you cook your, you cook uh, your food in the restaurant. I, I, I do, but still, I think there's a couple of things that I, I enjoy. One is uh, kaya toast. Uh, I love the savoriness. I love the sweetness of it. I love the custardy uh, texture of it. And I think it's essential eating. Uh, another is third floor bihun. Sito took me to JB Ameng last time we were here in Singapore, and I thought it was amazing. It has a great story, too, but it has great texture and it has great flavors. Actually, I'd like to take back my answer. I'd like some charcoal chow. <laughs> <laughs> Get all God knows what's coming up next. I, I personally would recommend that. I, my own favorite is bok chow. This is an amazing dish. It hails from South China. and. Uh, it shows the diversity and the inventiveness of the migrants. The Teochews came here, they brought the noodle here. It's like a vinegarish, spicy noodle they brought. But the Teochews here adapted sambal from the archipelago and they introduced sambal into that, uh, the, the noodle and they, 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 they inserted black vinegar in there and it's, it's a nice pork noodle. It's, very Singaporean and it's very unique. This kind of dish speaks volumes about the diversity of uh, comfort heritage food. Uh, 
everywhere, especially this part of the world. Another dish. Um, Can you spell that, by the way? B A K BA, which is in uh, meat. Chaw has two meanings. It's either, it either means vinegar or C H O R. It either means vinegar or minced meat. And me means noodles. Thank you. No rocket science. And uh, another dish. Oh, man. Where, where, where Does it have to be just two? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, look into my book, man. Bakuta, sop tulang. Yeah, sop tulang. Oh, man. Pepper crab. Just to add on a few things that uh, on Sitok remark about Singapore food. I'm from Indonesia and we are so close, but I still believe there's so many Singaporeans never taste what's the real the flavor of Indonesia because. Uh, Indonesia never exposed on the first place. We are very diverse. We are very scattered among 17,000 islands. There are few places that are closest to Singapore and whenever you go to, to Indonesia, which is Medan, has the most diverse representatives. It's a melting pot. And uh, now I'm working a lot with the government for the food diplomacy just to make everyone in the world just start to realize what we have. Anthony, you've been there. I wish you come the second time, show you a bit more. But uh, there's so many uh, unique uh, and uh, very, uh, what, what the French call the, the cuisine de terroir, the cuisine of the earth. They never travel, but it's, uh, it's uh, very unique. I just came back from one part of Borneo that we showcasing tasting of the, the food of earth. You know, everything grow around them the veggie, the, the herbs, uh, the fish around. So I hope, uh, I'm, I'm very, Sito has been talking to me for the last two years, his dream about this event. I hope the next will be bigger than this. And uh, we bring five vendors. This is uh, just a little part of the comfort food from Indonesia here that uh, maybe just put in the, the flag of uh, red and why that is you this year. Hope you will have the time to to taste a little bit of those flavors. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, two gentlemen who just came in. Mr. Fo Kwok is a culinary ambassador of Vietnam. He's, he's run his own culinary magazine called Morning On and uh, has his own TV show. He runs a little street food cafe. He helped us curate those uh, four in the, uh, Vietnamese stalls here. He speaks bad English, so go easy with your questions. <laughs> but he is a treasure trove of information when it comes to Vietnamese food. And uh, Mr. Abin Singh here is the founder of NASV, the National Association of Street Vendors of uh, India, uh, an NGO group, a uh, former lawyer, Give it all up because he wants to serve this cause of getting India to legitimize and recognize the up to 10 million street vendors in, in, uh, in India um, for uh, social enterprise, for all kinds of reasons. He just feels that people have a right to sell stuff on the streets and not be harassed and marginalized. So under that group, he has close to half a million members today. So that's a world of stories and opportunities there where you come from. Sorry, uh, Bokok, what are your two favorite dishes here and in, uh, and in, uh, and in Singapore? Or, or even Vietnam? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. 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 Uh, two dishes that I really enjoy eating. One would be the Indo uh, banana uh, dish with the sauce, as well as the samtam of Thailand. Simon, oh, uh. first, first I think Hokkien Mee. Hokkien Mee is a Singaporean dish, and most of Singaporean Chinese eat Hokkien. Um, it's, it's several rules. It's kind of an infused 
noodles. So it's noodles actually cooked in a stock. And it's right. actually meant to be quite soft. Braised and braised and you know. And then I love the way how it's so rich because it comes from both prawns as well as uh, pork. And then they put in lime and a bit of I feel very hungry now. Um, a, a bit of sambal to sort of sharpen it up. So you really have those different textures and different uh, tastes. And it's easy to get. Uh, bak chow mee I love also, but it's very, very hard to get a good bak chow mee nowadays. You know, at the end of this, you know, we get really, really hungry. Both of us were actually complaining, is that, you know, all that description is making us really hungry. For me, the first thing that I eat when I come back to Singapore would be, what else, chicken rice. And the other thing is that chicken rice, it must come with a bowl of steaming hot, teeth bouncing fish balls. Because uh, fish balls, you know, it, it has become uniquely Singaporean. Uh, whether you go to Taiwan or whether you go to China, the fish balls that you eat are just not the same. So for me, that that is home. You know, I'm the last, but I think Colin already answered half of my answer. <laughs> I, I love the fish ball noodles and the other things, uh, bread pepper crabs. But I think the white pepper crab is even better. She told me third one. I have two plates all on my own. <laughs> and with Singapore, this is a love and hate relationship. <laughs> because every time I come to Singapore, I gain one pound every day. <laughs> I still have that seven pounds from last time. Abid, what are your two favorite dishes here or in India? Well, I come from Eastern India, and uh, and one of the stall also is cooking litti chokha. Oh, that's the and uh, when we organize the street food festival in Delhi, uh, the the person, the two people who are here, they were the maximum profit earners. You know, so and uh, entire Delhi, you know, was uh, buzzed with the, their litti chokha. So that remains uh, a favorite dish. And from the southern India. Uh, actually, I, I came yesterday, I haven't tried the other dishes all around, but uh, from southern India there is a chicken 65 and that was also very favorite, you know, when we organized two festivals in Delhi. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, uh, we work with uh, the general street vendors, uh, but uh, we thought we would take up one sector uh, to focus more on that. And so we organized a workshop with the street food vendors and we decided how do we advocate your cause. And uh, the street vendors themselves said that, you know, people come with a lot of attraction to our stall. So if you organize a festival, uh, it will bring our plight to the fore and people would think more in terms of us rather than just organizing a seminar. So we organized two food festivals in Delhi and one we organized recently in Patna. And they were really huge draw and a lot of media attraction, a lot of government attraction. And it is now turning the table upside down. And now there is a process of uh, uh, registering the food vendors in India. And they use, you must have seen a stall from Mysore. There they have registered more than 2,000 vendors. And now they are providing training. And uh, this training, this exposure has been very good for them, the kind of training they have got. And they are saying that they will go back and they will impress the government. So more than what we say as activists, when they say it's uh, very different. And even this food festival, the World Street Food Congress, I must congratulate Sito and Patricia and the entire team. It has drawn huge media attention in India. And even online you can see a lot of coverage about that. And from the government also we got calls that when you come back, uh, we will come and discuss. So our main program, main uh, objective is not uh, not merely to make people eat, but to advocate the cause of the street food vendors. And that I think these festivals uh, are, are serving a great cause. We are at the verge of getting a central legislation for street vendors in India. And uh, we, we hope that this monsoon session in parliament it will get. And that will turn, that will change the face of Indian cities. And uh, my own personal goal is that in the coming five years, 100, 100 Indian cities will witness this kind of change, where street vendors would be legitimized. They would, they would not be harassed because the law which we are getting uh, makes participatory uh, decision making and focuses on natural markets and focuses on giving them licenses 
and no police uh, intervention or any other intervention. So that we are uh, we are really targeting very seriously, and we will get that it has gone through one two years of churning, and it is at the last uh, last stage. And uh, along with that, we have also decided that we will set up a street food vendors company. Uh, the, the, our executive committee decided, so we have started the process, as Sino was saying about the social enterprise. And uh, this food company, because as India is globalizing and uh, liberalizing, there are a lot of food chains that are trying to take the market. And uh, still in Indian countries, Indian cities, large number of people, more people depend on food vendors than on restaurants and hotels. So we believe that we have a legitimate right to keep serving people to enable uh, better livelihoods of the food vendors. So we are uh, this company process also uh, we started, and we are also learning from this World Street Food Congress uh, how do we take this forward. And we hope that in the coming days, they, and the food vendors are very excited; they are willing to participate, they are willing to buy the shares. So we are really hoping that we'll be set up, we'll be able to set up a company which is owned by the food vendors, and of course, mission <coughs> mission driven companies, individuals, and financial institutions. So one of the reasons why we were working with Rabin when I first met him was uh, when he tells me that there was like potentially 5 million street vendors in India will soon be legitimized. And my question is what next? There's a world of opportunities for everybody to hone in on. So coming back to the cause of this whole Congress, I, I, it was just a thought three years ago. And, um, I can't materialize this if I don't have the support of these people here a little more. And uh, so I had to visit all these people personally from around the world. The first person I had to, uh, I had to convince was Tony. I put aside 13 minutes of a spiel for him. And he said, yes, we did nine. Uh, by, 11, by the 11th, we were having a beer, I think, in New York. So I'm very happy I have all this, uh, the support of all these people here because the overriding objective of this whole movement isn't just about eating and knowing what we love for breakfast. Three things we want to do here. One is to preserve whatever old and new authentic or so-called authentic street food that's coming out of our grounds. Second, we want to professionalize their ways, their operations, methodology, approach. And the third is possibilities. We want to see and seek new possibilities. The three P's, if I may simplify it for you. So whatever we're doing here, it really revolves around this three P's. Because comfort, street food feeds the needy and the greedy in so many ways. Yes, Rebecca. Um, okay, I'm Rebecca from the Straits Times here in Singapore. Um, you know, here in Singapore, we're very worried about um, the continuity of our street vendors, our street food, and also who will form the next generation of street vendors. Can each of you maybe talk about how you feel about the, is, is there a degeneration in street food culture in each of your countries? Or are you worried about the death of street food culture, culture in each of your countries? Well, first of all, uh, Singapore has in the past, and continues to be, as best I can tell, very smart about their street food culture relative to other countries. Uh, I think Singapore is probably one of the first places to recognize the growing gastro-tourism sector and to promote the country entirely uh, from a culinary perspective. And I think it's been very successful, particularly by reaching out to chefs. Uh, chefs are the uh, sort of the uh, evangelists in this area. You know, where chefs go, uh, the diners tend to follow these days, particularly with, with this empowered chef class that we have now. People look to what the chefs are doing and where they're eating uh, for where they're going to go. And they're traditionally hostile to the street vendor. Okay, we we see the food truck as the roach coach, more or less. We see the uh, the person's uh, street stall is generally illegal, looked down on, uh, persecuted. Uh, people don't want them in their neighborhoods by and large. There have been a number of communities who've been a few communities have been very smart about it. Uh, Miami is reasonably supportive. Austin, Texas has been very supportive. Uh, Los Angeles has been cool. San Francisco has actually embraced the phenomena and, and uh, seen it as an agent of social change, as empowerment for uh, recent immigrants. Look, what is happening in... in there, there, I'll use Los Angeles as an example of what I, and what I expect we'll see elsewhere as street food hopefully expands. 
yes, if you want a, a, a real taco like in Mexico, chances are you're going to find it in a street, in, in a taco truck, as opposed to a quote unquote Mexican restaurant. So, in that sense, it's preserving a, a, a way of preserving tradi a traditional dish. But at the same time, what you are seeing is chefs like, like Roy Choi, who have, using social media and a whole new business model, created, take a traditional Korean cuisine and made it relevant to his life. You know, for him, he grew up, he may have eating, grown up eating traditional Korean food, which has remained for many years unchanged in America, but he grew up next to a Mexican neighborhood. So he created basically a Mexican taco. I mean, a Korean taco. It's delicious, it is a phenomenon, and it's opened the gates for a lot of people to for better or worse, and I think for the better, create dishes from their own personal past rather than from their ancestors. So we're seeing a lot of very exciting mutations in the sort of Momofuku, uh, Kogi, uh, uh, you know, the Ludo truck, what Paul P does in, uh, uh, in Austin, Texas. A lot of people have basically said, I'm gonna take the best of what my family served me, and I'm gonna mix it up with the things that I love about it, either American culture or Mexican culture or whoever the neighbors were, and I'm going to make something uniquely delicious. And I hope to see more of that. Um. Um, yes, quickly on, on the Singapore scene to answer the question directly, particularly in Singapore, there's a tripartite, it's a government term. People, the industries, the corporates and the government sees the need to address continuity. So the government is giving funding, they're setting up street food academies. If Singaporeans want to take up a course at this recently uh, inducted street food academy, they'll fund up to 90% of the course. Um, people love it in the industry. Um, they churn out a lot of products and services related to street food. <coughs> the only thing is engagement. A newer generation is, you know, Tepid response. So somebody has to light the fire. All the kerosene tanks are in place. So we go through this event, this movement, we can light this fire. Somebody who can answer this question better is the former chairman of the National Environment Association. They are the government agency that runs, operates, and regulates hawker centers in Singapore, all 107. Simon, please stop texting. Sure, first, uh, I must say that. To be fair to the National Environment Agency, I'm the former chairman, so I'm former chairman. I can't speak for them officially today. I think, though, we have discovered that hawker centers are key for the heritage, for the sense of rootedness in Singapore. So it's not just the food; it's the fact that you're eating it on our version of the street, the cleaned up, organized street called hawker center. Um, now we've realized that uh, this is quite late. So at one point, government policy used to be to phase out hawker centers. You all would live in a world where there'd be food courts. Nothing, I don't want to whack food courts, but it'd be a different world. Then, in the time I was chairman, we actually decided to revisit that policy and renew the home centers. We know that people want comfort, but could we deliver low cost, non air conditioned, still that sense of street, but clean, airy, and you know, without. Now, the new minister, Vivian Bakishna, has actually delivered the right to build new home centers. So in my time, we were redoing all the whole home centers, hopefully not in too artificial a way. And in terms of building new home centers, he's coming to another problem. Do the Singaporeans of this generation, the future, want to work in home centers? Quite honestly, let's not even exaggerate the past. A lot of them were working in home centers not because they thought it was the best thing for their lives, they had no education, they had no other opportunity, that's where they were. And some of them had talent. Right? And some of them were not very good. So how do we recreate the conditions in the future? I think a lot depends on the overall food conditions of Singapore. I think we're getting there. But the danger, and that's why I'm excited to be here, is that we are doing a lot of the top end. A lot of the young chefs, the you know, buzz is going to dazzling new restaurants, the MBS or wherever have you, or some you know, interesting locale in Singapore. Um, but to get a really good street culture, I think this is what Tony Bourdain was saying, you really need different nodes, you know? And you need that low-cost entry point. 
you need a plant where something interesting is going to come up, some interesting ideas and his take on traditional food or even try to cook his mother's recipes. And he cannot find the backers. He doesn't have the pocket to go and start up an Orchard Road or whatever have you. And instead, it's going to become that edgy place with buzz that people seek out. I think that's where the home centers are going to come back. Now, there's still the other element. In Singapore today, we also find that a lot of people are losing their jobs and finding trouble. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot because globally, it's not that big. But there, are, there is phenomenon going on where people are losing their jobs. Uh, they're struggling to get uh, income of their own. And there's always, there's always going to be this uh, social service element where you know, train people would otherwise be jobless to cook the de hope decent food, pretty good food. But I think that street food is going to have that buzz and that life if we do the other end as well. The exciting young guys who are going to try out something new in our new home centers or our old refurbished home centers. I, so I hope that's some sort of answer from the old guy. I, I like that what, what, what we're seeing, and I, what, what I think is inevitable, the salvation of the hawker stand, the hawker center, the, here as elsewhere, like it or not, is going to be the hipster hawker, okay? There will be young hipsters who do not want to be lawyers, they may have gone to law school, they, they, they don't, they're not going to, they, they don't want it, they don't want to have anything to do with it, they're rejecting what their parents told them to do, they're rejecting business school, they decide instead that they're going to want to open a bunch of, of, of uh, hawker stands serving delicious, delicious, and possibly strange new food. There will also be the retro hipster hawker center, okay, meaning people like Aaron Franklin in Austin, Texas, a guy who decided to devote his life to creating traditional, absolutely untouched by time, old school barbecue better than anybody else in America. That's all he does. He hasn't tweaked it. He hasn't brought it forward. He hasn't made it into a strange mutation. There will be people like that too who want to make it the, 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 the old school tradition. Young, hip kids who want to do it old school and nothing but old school and will look with utter withering contempt on anybody who messes with that. It's going to be two distinct schools of young, rebellious, you know, bad older sons and daughters who, who do this thing in the future and that will be the salvation of street food. All questions? Yeah, so I have one. Um, oh, sorry. I think Volkok has something to say on that. À, như các bạn cũng biết thì đồ ăn của Việt Nam á, thì uh, rất ngon và trong số các bạn thì cũng có rất nhiều người biết đồ ăn Việt Nam nhưng mà um, as many of you know the food of Vietnam is very delicious à, nhưng uh, những cái món ngon đó hoàn toàn là những cái món ăn đường phố của Việt Nam most of those most of our delicious food is actually found on the streets à, nhưng mà hiện tại đây á, thì ở Việt Nam á, thì những cái món ăn đó bán ở đường phố và đang bị cảnh sát á thì họ đã dẹp đi từ từ và trung bình một năm thì thì mất đi khoảng 10 đến 15 món. Um, however, uh, the problem is that many um, the police, public security will um, close down many of those hawkers and, and, and those street vendors and so each year we lose about 10 to 15 dishes. Uh, tôi là người đầu bếp thì tôi cũng uh, thích nấu ăn là từ do mẹ tôi nên là tôi muốn bảo tồn cái văn hóa nấu ăn đường phố, những cái món đang món ăn đường phố. Um, I'm a cook and I was influenced by my mother and I really love to cook street food. Uh, nên do đó thì tôi uh, có một cái phương pháp của tôi để tôi bảo tồn món ăn đường phố Việt Nam là tôi sẽ đến uh, từng những cái quán ăn đường phố và tôi mua lại công thức từ họ và tôi để họ chia sẻ với tôi và tôi sẽ làm thành một cuốn sách. The way that I have sought to preserve our street food culture is by going to um, each hawker and uh, buying, uh, talking to them about their food and actually buying their recipes so that I can create a book, I can write a book. Và khi mà tôi uh, chia sẻ với họ thì họ cũng được, cũng biết là chắc chắn là sau này họ sẽ đi có ăn đuổi và họ không được bán món ăn đó nữa. Thì họ chia sẻ tất cả những bí quyết của họ nói mấy chục năm nay. And they actually give me their secrets and their recipes because they know that they're not going to last very long in the streets with the police. And so they, they share it with me so that I could protect and preserve um, the, this recipe that's been in their family for, for many, many years and generations. À, các bạn đã từng đến Việt Nam thì cũng biết là những cái món đường phố bày bán thì mình thấy nó không có được vệ sinh lắm. À, nên là cũng chính vì điều đó mà tôi muốn đang xin chính phủ 
là để mình làm những cái quầy hàng nó vệ sinh hơn và nó thẩm mỹ hơn ở trên đường phố và cái dự án đó tôi đang xin được một năm thì có thể là chắc có thể là khoảng năm sau thì cái dự án nó sẽ được thông qua. So uh, for those who've been to Vietnam, um, it, you know our, our our street food isn't entirely uh, the cleanest, uh, and so what I've done is I've actually requested with the government to create more uh, sanitary conditions for our street food vendors, and I've been requesting that for about a year now, and it looks like next year we might have some. Um, some law in place that would make the conditions more sanitary and uh, much more uh, hospitable. Tôi đã sưu tập được một ngàn món ăn của ba miền từ Hà Nội, Đà Nẵng, Sài Gòn và tôi đã cũng liên lạc với một số những cái trại trẻ mồ côi và sẽ tập trung lại và tôi sẽ dạy một trăm món ăn đó và khi được cái chính sách nó được thông qua thì tôi sẽ hỗ trợ việc làm cho những cái em trẻ em đường phố đó. I've actually traveled throughout Vietnam and have collected more than a thousand recipes. And what I plan on doing is I plan on working with um, youth and or the youth and orphans of Vietnam, getting them together, and I'm going to train them to cook a hundred of these dishes to enable them to find jobs and, and create their own livelihoods through the cooking of these traditional dishes. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I've traveled from Hanoi to Da Nang. Uh, that's the capital of the whole country. Yes, and that's that's um, that's my plan for how I how I want to preserve Vietnamese street food culture. Uh, when it comes to street food in Indonesia, it's particularly catered to Indonesia. We are not yet foreign friendly. Uh, uh, street food. Indonesia has such a mentality. First thing about street food has to be authentic. Second, just good luck. They got something bad today is my bad luck. I come back tomorrow. <laughs> the government hasn't done much about how to, like in Singapore, to build a hawker center and things like that. Can you imagine that the uh, 250 million people in Indonesia, I would say more than 98% are still eating local food. But the percept, general perception in Indonesia that they got, well, we got invaded by McDonald's, we got invaded by Kentucky Fried Chicken. If I calculate by 2% out of 250 million per meal, there are 5 million McDonald's. There's nothing McDonald's can serve that kind of this, that kind of uh, quantity. So I still believe strongly the local food still play a lot of uh, a rule. The sad thing is the new generation, the new generation are only dreaming about Gordon Ramsay, about Al Bulli, about, no, he, they, they, they admiring Tony because he go down to a real food. And they're admiring all those, uh, they dream to be a TV star. But never touch, they never touch of the local food. Our education, 80% of a culinary education are foreign based. Because before, they only expect the region to go through the school, uh, culinary school, uh, hospitality school, they can work abroad. So we have to work hard to convince a new generation to showcase that look, like in Singapore now, this uh, world, uh, the World Street Food Congress. You never think about this is a real food, it's a real career. It's a people international thing about this real food. Like in Napa World of Flavor, 2009, they have a conference with the theme of the World Street Food. In about 60 or 50, the world chef coming to, to Napa to cook the street food, food in the US. And uh, in Jakarta, in Jakarta, the traffic like from airport to center city center can be four hours. And uh, how can you deal with the street food? You know, people just reluctant to spend two or three hours just to go for a particular thing. But the executive on the and lunch case, they will send the office boy to take a buy to buy 
this local food and bring to the office to eat in his own desk. But they would not go with the tide, with the hot condition to go to the street to eat. And a lot of street food do the, the rapid uh, uh, steel, deep steel building construction and things, and they've been gradually pushed away. And the other things that about the street food in Indonesia, they just copy it. The neighbor is famous with the satay, the next one they do the same thing. The repetition to do the same thing. And in the region and you travel, you find also the same thing of uh, good and bad street food. But the best still I found, home cooking. I think we, I just wanted to say quickly that one of the couple of things that we, the future of street food will be determined as a, everything is, by who spends money where. If people insist on spending money in hawker centers, and, for, and, and lots of tourists come to Singapore and spend money at hawker centers and demand more of them, and want to spend money there, they will of course survive. Same with street food in general. We're missing two big factors here, the two important things that have happened over the last few years. One, eating out has become a counter-cultural activity. That never happened, that was not the case. 20 years ago, kids in their 20s did not save money to eat at Le Bernard Ave. They were not willing to wait four and a half hours for a, 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 a five minute or 10 minute experience at a barbecue shack or, or at the Kogi truck in, in LA. Another thing, social media could be huge, okay? Kogi truck moved around from one area to another, avoiding the police, going to the worst underserved neighborhoods of, uh, of LA. They would alert people via Twitter uh, that in half an hour, the what truck would be in such and such a location. People would drive there and wait for three and a half hours for a taco. Now, if this is the, if this is the future, I'm pretty encouraged. <laughs> Questions from someone in the back? Anybody? Yes? Right. The, oh, yeah. Too much drain out character, uh, add a, um, a unifying design element to a, a hawker center. Anything that moves it towards food court and away from hawker center, it becomes a much less interesting place to me. Um, yeah, I, mean, I love food streets. What can what can these say? What you say, guy? You know, food street full of carts or you know, hawker centers. To me, street food is a cuisine. It's not a physicality. Uh, anyway, it, it can be uh, manifested in so many ways. But so as long as you're regulated, it's healthy. You know, who wants to eat at a fancy street food stall and go home with a with diarrhea? No one. Nobody wants that. So there's no harm. It's a small price to pay it's for a small price. price to pay, honestly. <laughs> Not the kind of diaries I get. But, but I want to really, I want to speak up for that. You know, the unifying design element is lethal, okay? What's great about the Hawker Center, one of the many great things is that somebody's talking to you. Each place is an individual voice. Somebody's saying, this is me, this is where I come from, this is my own unique, garish, sort of badly spelled sign describing whatever I'm doing in here. That's something. It's an, you get a feeling that you are visiting or you are making choices between a number of individual creative people, each with a story and a family or cultural or ethnic history to tell you. Once you change that and everybody has to conform to one design style, you may as well be the king, the clown, or the colonel. One big um, country that's facing a very big problem in that uh, space is China. They're washing them all, they're flushing them all in the streets. I visited Chaozhou with uh, Johnny last year, and we visited them. the old town of Chaozhou, a lovely old town. It's just set for demolition. There's pockets of little old street stalls still survive, fortunately. Johnny, what's happening with all this um, street food pockets all over China? You know, we'll discuss about that tomorrow. <laughs> but for the time being, I mean, Sito and I will be talking about Singapore a lot. And what he has done is tremendous. I mean, the whole country has done a tremendous showcase to the world. I really feel if I were the world in this coach ship, tomorrow I will give a recognition to the Singaporean street food recognition. I, I don't know who should do this. But perhaps by using this podium today, we're going to send a message 
to the people, maybe to the government, who, who are responsible for, for this process, a recognition to Singapore. Don't point to Simon, he's ex government. <laughs> but I, I think there's something well, actually. <coughs> Thank you. On behalf of Singapore government. <laughs> no, no, I think this, this should really be the case. The recognition. Any other questions? Actually, wait, I want to address that also. Um, there's a place in Los Angeles called the Original uh, Farmer's Market. And looking at it and looking and going to hawker centers in, uh, in Singapore as well, and looking how the model is over there, and it's very clean, and each of the stalls actually do have unique character, which I'm kind of uh, shocked by, right? Um, but the most important thing is, do all these places have that soul that we find in all of the, uh, the hawker stands here? Uh, not necessarily, right? But I think it's a good model, and it does exist. Um, and it's maybe something we can work on, I know in the States, and it is very regulated too, it's clean. Um, and there are places that are very soulful there, you can get you know, a Brazilian barbecue, you can go get Mediterranean food as well. Uh, you can get donuts, right? And it all kind of works there. So. That's an interesting one. Uh, welcome, Mr. James Olsen, <laughs> Editor-in-Chief Savoir Magazine from New York. Uh, was the line of the laksa that long? <laughs> <laughs> I was referring to my, di my, only, my paper itinerary. No, I'm sorry, my digital itinerary, not the paper one, but and having the most lovely, leisurely morning. <laughs> so no, many bowls of laksa, a, I cannot I think for you. <laughs> It doesn't matter, you're here now. I'm here now. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Miller. I'm here with Bon Appetit Magazine from New York. Um, a few minutes ago, Sita, you said that uh, street food is a cuisine, not a physicality. And I just want to know how much, I want to maybe hear some others weigh in on how true that is. I think I get a little more pleasure eating street food like in Vietnam or Malaysia where it's outdoors, um, but how much does that really matter and how much is it important to sort of compromise going forward and, uh, in order to preserve street food and maybe create hawker center type models in other countries? Let me quote Jonathan Gold from LA Times. Street has always been a place where it influenced fashion and, and music more so than ever, it's going to influence food. A lot of people are observing what sweet chefs do to influence their menu, their techniques, their approach, their culture in the menu. Because sweet food is what 80% of the world rely on. I think IMF figures 11, 12% of the world owns 89% of the world's wealth. The other 80% of us, like you and me, rely very common, very, very uh, commonly on comfort street food. So where this cuisine will go, it's an open field. Look, the best bowl of pasta in the world tastes differently in a sterile restaurant in, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan than the same bowl of pasta on, you know, a, you know, a, a bare table in Italy somewhere. You know, you're mopping the this, this sauce with a crust of bread. Uh, looking across the table at somebody you love, okay, that it, it's just a different experience. The best pho in the world tastes different in a strip mall in Los Angeles than it does sitting in Saigon at a low plastic stool, uh, smelling Vietnam and seeing everyday Vietnamese life unfold around you. It is a completely different experience. It 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 it, it, it changes the flavor. It changes the, the way you res your brain receives that experience. Uh, I'm quite sure that you were, you were secreting different levels of endorphins in your brain. It is just a different matter entirely. James, you want to take an answer? Um, it's a tricky question to answer. I, I think that, and maybe maybe I'm echoing a bit what, what, what Anthony is saying, the idea that um, there's a kind of almost a, a Forgive me, this is going to sound very strange, but it's almost this unpoetic forced sterility of the professional kitchen, where the kind of <clears throat> the kind of essential, gorgeous, accidental craftsmanship that can happen in a street food stall, which is really 
if, if, if you think about it, almost more of, a, of an approximation of the home kitchen. And I think that's what makes street food at its best so fabulous, is it's closer to what you'll find at home. And it's worth noting that the, the direction of fine dining over the last few years, held largely or propelled by, by chefs who love street food and have tried to, to you know, as best as possible, the Momofuku model has, has pushed fine dining to as close to a street model as yeah. you could get. It's a bare plank, you know, uh, 80s punk playing loudly over a sound system, and no nonsense, a guy in a snap front dishwasher shirt serving you what's good that day. That is increasingly what the diners, a new, a new segment of the dining public wants, and it is certainly what a great swath of uh, the young chefs want. And I guess I would probably also just add to that too that um, in a way also sort of uh, echoing the home kitchen or approximating the home kitchen, you're not finding menus with 80 items. You're finding you're finding um, menus that are that are so hyper specific that offer food foodstuffs that are or that offer foods that the, the, the individual cooks really, really excel in. You know, besides the dining and the culinary and the cuisine thing, I would also focus on the relationship aspect of the street food vendors, or any street vendors. You know. People like to go to a particular per stall, you know, to a particular vendor, you know, and the vendor also develops the relationship over a period of time. That's, a, that's also a big attraction. In comparison to the cold relationship in a food chain, you know, in McDonald's or anywhere. You know. So that, it, not only with the food vendors, in the, with the street vendors in general in India also. When we were setting, when with this uh, FDI happened or the new, this uh, retail chains were taking place, the vendors were not afraid of them in term, because they felt that uh, the relationship which they developed with the customers, you know, even for buying vegetables, they were sure that they will come to them only. The problem is with legitimacy. That is the that is to be the goal. So relationship is a very important tool for the vendors which they develop with the customers and they build upon that. Somebody else? Outside, William. I think I think in general the seafood, the dining, the street food, there are two things with this the continuity of the next generation. Because a lot of them the successful food, the street food vendors send their children to better school. When they graduate, they don't want to be on the street personality. And the other thing is also uh, the increase on the land price per square meter in some a lot of busy, busy places. And the other thing also, uh, a lot of new generation never, never go through this comfort food era of the local comfort food era. You know, they grew up a lot of like, for instance, the wealth, wealthy, more middle class up. They send their children to Singapore, they, they, they have a different lifestyle. So they, they never follow their parents' uh, uh, local flavor, comfort food uh, uh, era. This is another thing that they don't, they don't recognize. Like a lot of things is in Singapore, you are quite familiar with Kroa, you know, the black nut the dishes. But a lot of Indonesian kids, they, they see things black, they scare. They, they never taste those kind of uh, of uh, unique uh, ingredients. Any other questions, Maharani? Hello, I'm Maharani from Femina. Uh, I have two simple questions for all of you. Uh, what do you think would make a great street food stall? And also, uh, which country, uh, regardless your own? Uh, will you just fly to to get uh, the ultimate experience for street food? <clears throat> Look, I have a very romantic attachment to uh, street food in Vietnam. Uh, for me, like Bun Cha, Pho, uh, Ban Bo Hue, uh, Ban Mi, all of these things make me very, 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 very happy. But also, Mexican street food is awesome. And with my, Sido showed extraordinary good taste, extraordinary good taste, by inviting uh, La woman, La Guerrenze, which th this woman is a rock star in the world of street food. This is somebody who I would fly from New York to Ensenada to, to eat this woman's food. Uh, and I, I suspect that a lot of people feel the same way. 
uh, really an extraordinary expression of tradition, a family tradition, and, 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 a, and a personal creative vision. An extraordinary talent, and, and I think a, a shining example of this, of, of how great, uh, how much of a draw street food can be. Meaning, to address your question, this is a street stall worth getting on a plane in New York and flying all the way to Baja, Mexico for. Yeah, nhưng mà cái thì đồ ăn đường phố Việt Nam á thì sẽ chắc chắn sẽ ngon hơn ở trong nhà hàng. Tại vì ở ngoài đường phố thì họ chỉ nấu một món đến hai món, còn ở trong nhà hàng á thì họ nấu cũng những đó món đó mà họ nấu đến ba bốn chục món nên chắc chắn sẽ không ngon. So in, in Vietnam, the street food is much better than food in the restaurant. And the reason is because uh, the hawker, the vendor, will cook one dish or two dishes. But if you go to a, a, a restaurant, they will cook 30 to 40 dishes. Uh, và một điều đặc biệt là những cái người bán món ăn đường phố ở Việt Nam thì ít nhất họ bán được hai đời, có nghĩa là từ 30 đến 40 năm. Còn có những quán thì bán đến 4 đời. The thing about the, the vendors, the, the, the hawkers in Vietnam, is that each vendor will have cooked this for one or two generations, 30 to 40 years, uh, many 50 or 60 or more. Và người Việt Nam á, là rất uh, hiếu khách và biết lắng nghe người khác để thay đổi. Những người bán ngoan đường phố á, thì họ bán nó nói có thể là bị mặn, bị lạc hay là bị nó đậm quá. Thì khách sẽ cầm lên với họ và sau đó họ sẽ chỉnh và từ từ thì những người bán nhiều đời vậy thì đoạn họ rất ngon. Um, in, in Vietnam, the, the vendor will be receptive to the opinions of uh, the guest. Is it too salty? Is it too sweet? They will adjust it to the liking of the guests and over time it evolves to become a very delicious dish. Chính vì thế là món ăn đường phố là tiếp xúc với nhiều loại khách khác nhau họ là họ chỉnh vô vị và sẽ ngon hơn những trong nhà hàng. So the interaction with the customers on the street uh, will inform how the dish changes and so over time the food will be much better than that of the restaurant. Giống như là khi mà tham gia cái lễ hội này ấy, thì tôi có đưa sang là cái quầy chuối nướng uh, stick dry banana thì đã bán được ba uh, đời và đang truyền đến đại con. Uh, one of the vendors that I brought here from Vietnam is the fried banana with the sticky rice. They have been cooking this dish for three generations now and it's being passed on to the fourth generation. Và họ bán trong một cái con đường rất nhỏ và rất đông ở đây Việt Nam. And they cook on a very very small street, uh, small alley and it's it's very crowded. Um, it's 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 very crowded. Thank you. I would not go to eat satay without smoke. I would go some place with this heavenly smoke that will never happen in hotel. I will never eat nasi goreng. It's cooked 50 portions in one go. It's only, it's only one portion at one time. And the other thing about the street food has to be passionate. What in, in, in Asia, very highly specialized on very particular dishes. This is what we go for. We have time for just a couple of questions. Anybody else? Kevin? Hi, I'm Kevin Cox with Food Walker. Um, a lot of what I'm hearing you're saying is, is, is something that I see and hear all the time here in Singapore. And, and to me, if you had to boil it down, the key to continuing the food culture of the traditional hawker style, as opposed to the new kind of young cook who's going to culinary school and then starting either a stall or a restaurant, is to find a way to motivate the young people to follow in the footsteps of their parents. I've had so many hawkers in Singapore tell me, wow, my kids, they're sissies. They want to sit in an office with their feet up in an air con on the desk, and they don't want to work as hard as I work, and that's why they won't learn it. So the key is how do you make it kind of sexy for them? How do you motivate them so you don't just have the hipsters, but people actually following with the traditional food from their Look, childhood? Somebody, the rice farmers, who've worked, who've been rice farmers for four generations, who have just now managed to send their kids through sweat and toil to engineering school, 
to get an engineering degree, it's a very hard argument to make that, well, actually, to preserve your traditional culture, they should stay on the farm. I don't think we, I think that's a losing argument. I think you're gonna see people like Aaron Franklin, uh, who come from uh, more comfortable backgrounds and have decided this is an entrepreneurial uh, sector that I can do very well in. And what interests me is I'm going to make roast goose the way that guy has been making it for four generations and I'm gonna make it better than anybody else. And that's what I'm gonna do. It's going to, there's gonna be new blood uh, to expect people who've toiled generation after generation so that their kid can get a, 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 a medical degree uh, to send the kid back, you know, to, 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 to put on the soup pot, I think is probably unrealistic. Um, but, you know, remember, there's an appetite for this. You know, one of the hottest foods in America right now in all the high-end restaurants, it's like pig's foot, tripes, snout, cheeks, you know, guts, all of the traditional old-school poverty foods uh, that people used to sneer at. So I think there is real opportunity and a real desire for that, and I think there will be new blood to step in and, and, and take over, both in new dishes and preserving all of it. Um, it, it's true. It's uh, kind of difficult for many old generation hawkers to be passing down a recipe uh, down to their educated children. You know, this iPadding content all day long. It's a physical toil. So a lot of them just don't want to stand in a stand and, and, and slave over a stove. What we're trying to do here is that uh, we want to open up uh, avenues. We, we, we are, we're telling the older generation of masters, hey, listen, don't just hand a recipe over, hand an entire brand, a legacy, a business, an opportunity to your children who could take this to the next level based on all the opportunities everybody here can offer for anybody who wants to take on street food into the next generation. I think the corollary to that also is doing what, I think the corollary to that, uh, to help support it and help motivate people to do these things, is Tony, what you do and actually what a lot of us do here, food writing, food exploring, and that sort of thing, because if you make it, if you make it sexy and interesting to the people to go out and eat it, then you're gonna have the phenomenon that you mentioned, Tony, where the people are spending the money on it and they're buying it. That's gonna motivate people it, to keep doing it. It is sexy and interesting. Yeah. It all, food always tastes better when it's eaten with your hands, so, yeah. Any other questions? Actually, I kind of want to address that really quick. Um, I think I'm one of those people that I, like a good Asian son, I, I studied molecular biology and business administration and went to UCLA, right? Um, but I realized that's not what I really wanted to do, and that I love cooking. And so part of the reason I'm here, I hope, is to encourage other people um, that it is a field that can be lucrative, um, but it's very personally rewarding, right? And it is sexy. Um, I think, quoting Jonathan Gold again, right? He said that food is the new rock. You know, back in the day, we used to spend money and go to concerts, right, and go see bands. But now, a lot of the gener younger generation are saving their money and they're going to eat, going out to eat. And so I think that's really important. I think it's probably worth noting that in my experience, chefs probably get laid a lot more than engineers. <laughs> My wife agrees. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Monica from Channel News Asia. I have two questions. Um, the first is, was there ever a chance that the first uh, World Street Food Congress would have been held elsewhere uh, other than in Singapore? I mean, there is such a vibrant street food culture in the region itself. And secondly, where do you see the street food congress going in the future? Um. It's held in Singapore because it's convenient. I know all the plugs and stops and all the pull to put together something like this. But hey, any country that celebrates comfort street food culture and has, and has supplies, we will be there. Because uh, it, is, it, is an, it is not a, uh, a Singapore event. It's a street food event held in Singapore. See, held in Singapore. It can go anywhere. Well, I hope to travel because uh, there are so many more flavors, people, culture to explore beyond just what we can see from this little red dot that people call Singapore. Right? 
Yeah, one more question before we go eat. Any more? Yes? Uh, I understand that the offerings that you have here are uh, the best representation of the food of the field, of, 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 of the spill. Uh, how do you actually settle on Wee Nam Tea instead of uh, Tian Tian Chicken Rice? I mean, what is the criteria for bringing in? I know it's a contentious thing, but... Um, it's like, it's like, who's better? The male or the female? The man or woman? Who's better? Best? Uh, that's why I work with my uh, collaborators here. So if you don't feel it's the best, I'll blame him. But hey, look, best is a four-letter word. It's one of those four-letter words. Uh, we choose these people because they are a good representation of some of the best. There are millions of street food vendors out there. I dare, I'll declare to you, none of us have ever visited any one of them. We track and track and track in our, in our quest to, to award the best. We're not just looking for the best flavor. Some of the criteria we look at awarding uh, these top hawkers are versatility, adaptability, uh, scalability, exportability. Do they know their food or do they only want to use a leaf that grows in the backyard? Which means that's a death knell, uh, that's a death knell for that store. They can't move. And if that tree behind them dies, they got no more leaf to cook their good or any other dishes. So these are various factors we want to attract. The, uh, the hawkers that we, we choose for events has to be inspirational. <coughs> so best, like I said, uh, it's a uh, four-letter word. Okay, if there are no questions, we shall... Oh, yes, yes uh, we, if there's no other questions, we'll all like to stand up and let some blood flow for some photo op. <laughs> <laughs>